Okay, so welcome to the Chaos OSPO working group meeting for January 25th, 2024. Uh, we have we have a nice group here. We have um, our question of the day is something you do to relieve stress. So these some interesting answers here. So this is this is good. Um, we have a few things on the agenda. There is still space if you want to add some things to the agenda. So feel free to, to do that while we work through some of the, the earlier items. Um, let's start. Sean, you wanted to provide a software as a service update. Do you need to share your screen or are you? I, I, I don't good? think I do. Okay. Uh, I'll just add the URLs into the notes after I talk. Uh, there have been a number of really useful updates to the 8 knot software. And I know Callie's not here today, so perhaps she can give us a deeper overview in a couple of weeks. Um, and the uh, we now have some uptime monit management stuff um, on the Augur and 8 knot public instances. So that's thing one. And uh, I'll put the URLs in the notes when I'm done talking. And the second thing that's happening is OSS Compass, which is the metrics model tool that was developed uh, with a combination of Grimoire Lab and the Asia Pacific group is going to start getting deployed on a <coughs> server in Europe um, <clears throat> over the next month. So Enoch Casada, who has been a big contributor in Chaos Africa and project badging, is now a PhD student here at Missouri. And he, uh, a lot of what he's going to do is going to focus on the software as a service uh, for chaos and making that more widely available, which is, by the way, one of our major goals for the project this year. And that's that's the update. And I don't know if there's any questions. <clears throat> any questions for Sean? Okay. Um, let's move to the the next agenda item. So this is. We have a starter project health metrics model, which is four simple metrics to kind of get people started. Um, the viability metrics models are pretty awesome, but it's it's a lot. So uh, <laughs> there are a few of us that were chatting about how we might be able to do um, sort of a, how we might want a starter viability metrics model. So of course I asked Gary um, how we might do that. And so I will turn it over to Gary to talk a little bit about some of his his thoughts based on a couple of days of notice, because I just mentioned this to him, I think, earlier this week. Yeah. Um, thanks for that, Don. And also, luckily, I have been thinking about this because I, I realized that I'm full time dedicated to making this work and being able to track viability uh, at Verizon and for things that we care about. But I just don't expect that every company, the same way that every company doesn't have the right amount of funding for what they want to do in open source, they might not have the right amount of funding or attention for what they want to track about their open source usage. So I had thought about like, how would I be able to um, pull this apart? And it's a little intuitive to say that I'm picked some of the biggest metrics that we can still track easily uh, using chaos tools and then put those as like, this is what you would need to just do a baseline of pick a bunch of these and you get generally the idea of what, what we're trying to track with the bigger model. Um, and so that's the bus and elephant factor for being able to see what the contributions look like, uh, both from just the contributor standpoint, how many contributors have to leave before you lose 50% of contributions. And then the elephant factor of how many companies or organizations would have to leave before you lose 50% of contributions. That feels like a decent strategy proxy. Um, there's the community for change requests, like how active is the project? How many change requests is it receiving? Uh, there's more here that I would really like to get into, but the whole point of this model is to slim it down. And so I, you know, for the community, it feels like it's being a little underserved, but it's, I think that that's, that's kind of the nature of the exercise. Uh, the change request closure and the live years feels important for governance to say how much is the project being kept up to date? It's something I, I, intuitively don't think that community members will normally do is try to dig out a dependency and then update it uh, throughout the code base. It's usually a concerted effort that happens through a series of issues or a series of uh, changes. And then the change request closure ratio is, is an indication of how much the maintainers are able to keep up with the traffic that comes in. Uh, and then the com com uh, compliance and security, I think, the OSI approved licenses is the only one that's really easy to track in an automated way. 
there's more here for security, but a lot of folks also get security notifications um, through some other tool uh, or some other way. So I didn't think that it was that critical to have to track uh, in the viability model specifically. So I'd love to take um, some ideas or comments or thoughts about all of that. Like, is there something that's very obviously missing from any of these? Well, the big thing I notice, of course, is that you've pared it down a little bit from what we saw before, right? Yeah, that's right. And and that was the intent. Uh, that was the purpose of the exercise is that I wanted it to be a lot smaller. Um, Don uh, had pitched, maybe we could do four. And I got down to six and I said, that's enough. Um, I'm not, <laughs> not going to butcher it anymore. I can't do that to my boy. Uh, how are you calculating these? Jamie asks. That's a good question. Um, I remember that Augur is able to calculate this, but how it's calculated would be up to the technical specifics of which Augur. is that the Libyers one specifically? Yes, Libyers specifically. Right. So the way it's calculated is it looks at the most recently released version of a library and compares that to the version of that library that is in your code. So if the most recent version was released two years ago and you're on that version, your lib years would be zero because you are at the most current version. And if it was, if you're at one that's two years old and there was a new one released last week, then the lib years would be in that neighborhood of two years. And that's uh, defined actually that way in the chaos metric for lib years. Oh yeah. And Jamie uh, found that. So awesome. awesome. Thanks for yeah, that. I. I asked the question and then remembered that I had already seen it before, so I thought I'd add that for completeness. Um, yeah, I, I, I have a version of this in my notes that links to every single one of these, but then uh, I pasted it and it didn't carry the hyperlinks. So sorry about that. Well, it's good to know there's some coherence between our documentation and the stuff I'm saying. You're doing a great job documenting. <laughs> that's what that means, Sean. <laughs> or at least um, I remember what we wrote. <laughs> uh, OSI for license. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. The so change request closure ratio and bus factor are also easily done in Augur because I've already got code that does those. Mm -hmm. um, the one that worries me in this, um, from just from a gathering standpoint, I think it's super important and should be in here. But um, elephant factor, because that's really really hard because it's hard to get good data about people's affiliations and what companies that they work for. Yeah, there's a there's a like the companies that do this well are maintaining their own lists, right, Don? Yeah. Right. Yeah, the CNCF has a huge, um, for, for dev stats, they have um, a whole, it's actually a bunch of files that have basically where everyone who's contributed to CNCF projects has worked um, over the past, I don't know, forever. And it started out of, I think, like the, the Linux kernel had this. And so it uses the same git DM kind of um, approach. And they actually, so so people update it because uh, you know companies really want to get credit for it. So this whole like elephant factor thing, they really want uh, to get credit for the work that their company, their employees are doing on behalf of the company. Um, but what the CNCF actually does, I was I was talking to the uh, Lucas who uh, maintains dev stats. They actually have a contractor whose job is to go out and look on LinkedIn and Google people and figure out whether they still work for the company that they say they work for. Um, so, so it's not, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to automate, I guess. Yeah. And I think, uh, I, I guess I'm curious if you think that that's a big enough problem that it shouldn't be part of the model or if you're bringing it up as like a potential difficulty with gathering that data. Because I've found that like a simple proxy for this is usually the domain of the email address that people use, like periodic or it's enough of not a problem that you can get a good idea of what the elephant factor might be. Um, there are obviously some projects where people are privacy aware and do like no reply .com, So you have no idea what their domain would be coming from. But um, like, uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I was expressing it as as the difficulty in gathering. Um, I'm not sure whether it should be in or not based based on that. I'm curious what other people think because I know this has come up at other 
other companies. I'd be curious what you think, whether whether this is worth including in there, given the challenges with collecting it. Uh, Brian, you had your hand up first. And you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> I agree that it's important to collect and, and, and I recognize the challenges that you're talking about because Red Hat is one of the places that we are collecting it ourselves um, and trying to even get our own employee information is difficult, let alone others. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to add a, a caveat to the point that you made. You're absolutely right about the CNCF contractor, but anecdotally, I've talked to a couple of people familiar with that that person is way behind as well. Um, and really just, and no fault of their own. It's just a massive amount of work. Yeah, um, it's, it's mm -hmm. super hard. Uh, and, yeah, so when I was doing my PhD on the Linux kernel, I spent months on this activity, just data cleaning, months. Right. And I know, you know, Baturgia has Sorting Hat, um, which tries to take care of this, but this one not only is important, it makes me really, edgy because of the privacy issues um, and keeping that data in hand, uh, you know, opens us up for potential problems with GDPR and all the other uh, uh, similar acts. So I, I don't really know if I have anything constructive to say, but it would be nice if we could somehow figure this out. Yeah, and and on the data privacy issue, the, the public instances of Augur, we don't display any PII. So that would, you, we wouldn't be matching the people to the companies. It would just be the companies and right. the bus factor. If we did it out of an auger public instance would be just, um, just that without the names associated right. with it. Uh, Sophia, you had a comment. Uh, mostly Brian said it all plus one. I think it, it is a really helpful thing to track and it's always going to be difficult to collect and it's never going to be fully accurate. Um, also, our version of this never sees the light of day and it is highly locked down <laughs> uh, because of the PII issues mm -hmm. and consideration for regulatory compliance. Like this is not something that's shared broadly, but I'll say anecdotally that we also use it as a reflective thing to see if we are successfully increasing community contribution. Like I think it, it goes both ways. It's from mm -hmm. the evaluation of it being one company led versus the project has a goal of increasing community participation. So one of the ways you can track that is what percentage is still us <laughs> are, are we actively making this project more accessible mm -hmm. to others? Um, and so I think like for us, we're looking at it from both ways. I think it's an important part of an evaluation and I think it's always gonna be difficult. I've also spent a lot of time manually doing this depending on the case. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's ugly, but I would say keep it in there. Um, Alain, you've got your hand up. Yeah, quick question. I have been spending almost two years on this topic. Um, how are you guys handling the private contributors or the companies that contribute from private accounts? Is that a question to the other OSPOs or to us as the Chaos Project? anyone that has a, any solution. Yeah, that, that was my uh, take, unknown, uh, private. I'm treating everybody private, but it's not fair. Yeah, I think it, I think it depends a lot on the, yeah, on the individual solution. Like Sophia said, I think a lot of us keep that data private. Um, from a chaos perspective, we don't, uh, we don't share that. Um, and, Sean, why don't you respond to that? Because you're more into the the data collection. In in, I don't know exactly all the details of how Sorting Hat works, but I think Augur does something similar, where any email that a person uses to commit gets recorded, and then we can look through those emails to see if there are any commits with an organization domain in them. Like we don't use the CNCF ones, but. No, yeah, and sorting it, sorting hat does some additional stuff too. So yeah, you can do I know. some name matching, for example, uh, mm -hmm. within sorting hat. And um uh you can merge and unmerge things because you know a a big project will have some people with the exact same name who are not the same person. Um creates all all manner of confusion in big projects. But um, but yeah, so it does it does do some name matching as well in addition to email addresses. 
but that leads to something else. Sorry for jumping again. No, um, you have a person that contributes in the company time as the company and the same person would work, let's say a weekend out of passion on the same project. And that's private time. Yeah, that, that's a super hard question. I, um, and there's, there's no good, there's no good answer to that, right? Like we, we don't know in someone's head whether they're working on personal time or private time. And you can't really tell that by, by time zones because, you know, people work all kinds of, you know, I work until 7 PM a lot of times in the UK, cause that's when my meetings are. Um, and that's, that's not personal time. It's, you know, it's, it's work time. Uh, Angie, you've yeah. got your head up, hand up. Do you have a thought? Yeah. Uh, the only thing I was going to say about that is Drupal implemented this thing, um, and it's I would not necessarily recommend everyone do this, um, but if you look approximately halfway through this page where there is a animated GIF type of thing, we have like two separate ways of specifying that. Either I'm volunteering on my own time or I'm volunteering at an organization for a customer of whatever size thing. And there's an open issue in the GitLab tracker somewhere to try to do this kind of feature for GitLab as a whole. So like anybody who is using that open source project will be able to use the same thing, but it's all very like slow and, you know, whatever <laughs> kind of thing. But that's that's how we've managed to do it. But it's like all kind of like our own tracking, like it's not something broadly applicable to other projects, but we're hoping if we can get into GitLab proper as part of the adoption of that platform, that at least that would open it up to other folks. But then you can do some interesting calculus from there to try to figure out how many how many of your volunteer or how many of your issues that got closed are by organizations or people in their volunteer time or a mix of both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks, Angie. Um, did you have anything else, Ellen, or use your hand still just just up? I don't think I can put it down. <laughs> um, well, I, I feel pretty confident that um, this is a interesting enough metric from how much people have chimed in that we should uh, <laughs> at least attempt to include it, even if it's not always the best data or always perfect. I, I would agree. I would be inclined to include it. Uh, Sophia just gave that a thumbs up as well. Um, I think if I remember correctly, I'd have to read the elephant factor uh, again, but I think we address some of these things in that metric as as caveats that it's um, a challenging metric. Okay, cool. I feel like we've uh, we've covered that that pretty well. So um, I think I think probably the next step is to start drafting that Gary and then bring it into the metrics model uh, yep. working group. I'll see you next so, week with that one. <laughs> Awesome. I did all of the legwork for all of the metrics and how they fit together already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then, yeah, so the next two weeks will be a little weird. Um, I'm not sure how many people will be in that meeting because of Chaos Con, FOSDEM, and State of Open Con. So there, I'll, I'll bring it a bunch of times. You'll get sick of me. There you go. Exactly. We'll work on it. We'll work on it all the times. Um, okay. So the next thing that I wanted to bring up is uh, so the we have a data science working group, which historically has been kind of me as the, the data science person talking about the work that I've been doing. And it's been a great place for a lot of Q&A, info sharing, getting feedback on things. So I know Sophia has brought in some some things that she had questions about how other people were, were dealing with things. Um, so we've typically used the meetings for, or used the data science community within chaos for that. But we have a lot of people within that chaos community who are interested in actually working on data science projects. So they're people who are maybe already data scientists. They're people who want to build skills in data science. So we, we talked about this in the last meeting about coming up with um, with projects for data scientists to work on within the chaos community. So things that would be broadly applicable to, um, you know, to multiple companies. And, um, and uh, Bran, who was one of the people, Bran Kai, 
he was one of the people in the last data science working group call and he put together this um really good template that we could use to kind of scope out some some projects and so we were we were thinking that we would bring it in here and see if anyone has any thoughts on projects that you would like to see um, chaos as a community work on. And then we can take things back to the chaos data science group and data science community within chaos um, and get some people working working on stuff. I think this is a really good opportunity for people to, to use the skills they already have, to build new skills. Um, also, as a piece of this, I earlier today convinced Chan to be my uh, data science working group co-chair. So I think Chan is going to uh, help with some of this as well, because I, I feel like um, the data science working group is one of the only ones that didn't have a, a co-chair. And I think that's I think it's important from just a continuity standpoint. So Chan's going to step up and, and help with that. And this is in particular something that, that she's passionate about. Oh, Chan, if you want to add anything to that. I just want to say thank you for including me on it, and I'm really excited to be part of the group. I'm hoping that um, uh, we can work on some really interesting topics that are meaningful to the community um, and give people a chance to um, show off their data science skills. I'm and sorry, I have my camera off because I'm eating carrots. <laughs> so. No worries. And for people who don't know Chan, her background is actually in data science. Um, I know a lot of us interact with her in, you know, in the context of the, the OSPO stuff. So I think this is, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to it. So, so my question to all of you is, are, you know, is there any project that you can think of that would be something that would be interesting to have um, some people work on within the chaos project? I kind of want to throw in there that like um, when I was thinking of different projects, I was like going on the chaos website and I was like, oh, they already did that or oh, they already did this. And so um, kind of had like trying to get a background of like um, new things that you guys would like to see um, or things that you can extend off of based on what um, you guys have done in the past years. Cool. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Angie, you've got your hand up. Well, I was just going to say, what about, um, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Aline? What about Aline's question about the breakdown between sponsored and unsponsored time? You know, I don't know that there's enough data to science around that, but like, it feels like you could do qualitative analysis or something like that. And that would be a really interesting question to have an answer to, whether it's possible to get an answer to it, I don't know. I'm going to sort of comment on that right now. Um, I'm sorry, I'm jumping in. I have attempted that inside of my own organization uh, because I had more data and I could go talk to people about it and multiple sources of information. And I came up with a really rough estimate and it's very rough and it couldn't really be clarified unless we talked to every individual. Um, because of that, the problem that someone else mentioned of you're working on a project in both contexts. If it was easy to separate, like it was very clearly we could find things that were clearly related to Google, like clearly that were personal. So on both sides of it, we could isolate work that was one or the other. And then there was this huge gray area um, that we really couldn't get more granularity on without finding a better way to track it like the Drupal project. Um, but I'm curious if others have tried this as well. Um, I will attempt to get that externalized because I think I would like to share at least the approach that I took. Um, I probably won't ever be able to share the data, um, but I would like to be able to at least share the methodology. Gary. Yeah, I, I wonder this might or this might not be the right um, kind of project for the data science working group, but there's a good handful of metrics that are available on the chaos site that aren't available from any chaos tools. So some of them that I already have uh, readily available are types of contributions is just not something that's easy to track in any chaos tool. Uh, release frequency is not easy to track in chaos tools, documentation usability, open SSF best practices, license coverage. And so I wonder if those would make good projects because some of them are pretty bite-sized of 
uh, this should be available in Grimoire Lab, for example, or this should be available in Augur, for example. Um, but that might be crossing over with another working group. So I don't know if that's appropriate, but that's definitely something that I plan on contributing at some point if nobody else does. Oh, Elizabeth, I got into Augur. Sorry, the last time I pulled data, I must have had it wrong then. There's a, uh, yeah, there's an open. Is. Um, I have I have code for that. Oh, and the open SSF scorecard. Um, uh, Elizabeth, we talked about this in the metrics development slash common working group. Were we going to have like uh, program managers kind of help us organize some of this? I'm trying to remember what we decided. We, what did we decide? We decided that we were not organized yet enough to bring, <laughs> to bring in the project managers, but that once we um, kind of sort things out, um, then we will bring them in to help with that. That's what I recall anyway. Okay. I think we have, so we have a spreadsheet where we have started this work where we were trying to audit all the metrics and like where they where they exist and how you know what tools we could get them in. Um, but I think that's pretty much out of date now, but that's a start so we could maybe start with that. Okay. Um, Justin, you've got your hand up. Um, 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 I just um, heard like a doorbell so I have to go, but I will come back in my 30 seconds. Yep, no worries. Uh, anybody else have have some thoughts? On what might be good, good work or interesting work for data scientists? I'm curious, Sophia, what you think? Because you, you've been in both both meetings. You do data. Yeah, I mean, I always have thoughts. Um, I don't know. I feel like what we were hoping for in this context was like, I feel like we have come up with a couple of data issues in, in the broader OSPO working group context. Um, and I was trying to remember what those were. Uh, I know they're probably deep in the notes. Um, but I think, I guess part of the thoughts process we had in the working group was that it would be great if we solved problems related to our extended community. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to list them now because I feel like we'll just get lost on a rabbit hole. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll think about it. And if one sort of bubbles up, you can bring it back. Uh, Justin, okay, now that you've addressed the doorbell, great timing. Yeah, um, so, so, so like um, for, for the um, um, elephant um, factor, um, what I like would be like a, um, um, what great about there would be that like um, um the um, the um, um, repository would like um suddenly um get um archived um even though um it was like um active um before or that like um license would like um change or um um outside a pull requests um would it be um merged so um I would be um interested in um, the like um, data science group, um, maybe um, finding um, a large um, collection um, of examples of like, um, and those um, th things occur. And then like, I trying to um, back out um, the variables that like um, I um, predict them um, because like um, on my view uh, um, um, membership in um, 
I mean, like, uh, co companies, I mean, it's just like something that's like never going to scale. Mm -hmm. Um, and so like, um, Dan, it's, um, also a, 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 a proxy, um, for, or the things you're on, um, actually, um, worried about, right? Um, so, um, I kind of think, um, maybe, I um, instead of like, uh, tr trying to like, um, figure about, uh, um, figure out, um, organizational, like, membership, um, I mean, it might be like better to, to um, skip that and go like um, straight to the um, things like um, that you're like um, read about like um, happening because like we can probably like measure those and th there's no like our privacy problems there. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay, I have thoughts. <laughs> and I, re I yeah. really like what Justin was saying. And I, I think that some of that came up at the end of the risk working group uh, meetings where we were realizing that the things we really wanted to measure were intangible uh, in terms of predicting some of these potential failure modes um, or risks that could happen to the project. Um, but the idea I really had and something that I struggle with as an analyst is um, how to draw boundaries around classifications, uh, which sounds really abstract, uh, but it can be difficult to do that. Say even what is a project and how do you conclude what specific repositories in that project, um, as well as what kind of project it is and what life cycle the project is in. Um, and sort of some of these basic things that we like to talk to, about projects in, like we're talking about this project, it's this year's old, it's in a phase of growth or it's in a phase of stability or it's in a phase of decline. Um, and these are all kind of general concepts that we like to apply to our projects, but often these, the way that we classify it is based on intuition. Um, and I think it, we're kind of at a point in open source where there's enough ex examples that we could look at this more comprehensively to try to see if there are better ways that we can estimate these things with more certainty because we're looking at a sample of 100 projects um, that we can say are behaving in these similar patterns enough to say that yes, we have like a, a range of things that may or may not be included in the project or that may or may not signal that this is in a state of growth or stability. Um, but we now have a range, which is nothing, like better than nothing. Um, and so it's, it's a hard problem, but I think that it's a problem that can only be solved with large scale data analysis and modeling. Um, and so that's a really general way of posing like a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> um, but like as an analyst, I like, I don't know, we love having categorization around projects um, and ways that we, we talk about it. And again, often that's just based on feelings. Um, and if you're like me, I'd rather we replace feelings with actual data um, and so I think we could get more specific into what kinds of projects like problems like that can be actually solvable um, in, in the context of this working group. But that's, that's, I guess that's how I'm thinking or one of the ways that I'm thinking about what could be done. Um, but that's really general. And again, many, many possible rat holes. Cool. Thank you. I, I would say yes. um, if, if either of you want to add to the notes and make sure that I captured things accurately, that would be that would also be helpful um, in the this elephant factor section, which, as Sophia mentioned, is probably a couple of things, um, maybe a couple of projects rather than a single project. But I think maybe this this is something that would be a good thing to to start with. Um, uh, I'm gonna say start with, but scope down into multiple projects. Um, cool. So I, wanna, I think, oh, go ahead. I'll Make just volunteer up. that if, when this effort gets to looking at actual data, I'd be happy to help 
cool. if it's useful. Um, yeah, because I mean the the good thing is that we have we have a lot of projects already loaded into um, Sean's Augur instance, so we've got we've got a lot of of data in you know in sort of a selection of different types of projects. Mm -hmm. So it'd be a good be a good starting point, I think, maybe to do some do some analysis. I think we need to we need to. Like I said, we need to scope this down. We need to figure out which pieces of it are multiple projects so that we can get people get people working on it. But I think maybe if we if we take the the template, um, well, let's figure out let's figure out which ones are separate projects, and then maybe fill out the template for for a couple of them. Does anybody want to sort of sort of take the lead to work on this? Our next. Our next data science working group isn't until February 14th because a lot of us are going to be out the next couple of weeks. But does anybody want to sort of take the lead on this? Sorry, Dom, what was the timeline for that? Because again, thinking about all the traveling and out of offices. The next two weeks is tough for me. Yeah. Um, something like that. Yeah. So I would say get as far as we can. If, <clears throat> um, if what we get before the February 14th data science working group meeting is maybe a list of, um, you know, some kind of separation of, of which of these might be separate projects, um, that would be that would be a good start. Um, we could start filling out the template for any of them that we think we have a better, better feel for. But um, I would say if we have someone who wants to drive this and pull a few of us in, then we can we can make as much progress as we can, knowing that a lot of people are, are going to be out. Don, could we potentially use the next meeting when everyone's back to revisit this and then kind of maybe, I don't know, use 15, 20 minutes to hash out some of the details of what it what it is and what um, what leading it might look like or what being involved might look like? Yeah, that sounds that sounds great. We could bring it into the um, OSPO working group meeting in two weeks which would be uh, the eighth. I'm, I'll be honest, I'm probably not available for that one because it's the day after State of OpenCon. Um, but. I'll be here. We can bring it awesome. up. Awesome. All right, Gary, you were in charge of that one. Everybody heard that. Oh, no. <laughs> Look at that. That's what, what you get I for being a co-chair. No. <laughs> <laughs> all right done um yeah so some of us are going to be uh traveling and um, unavailable but we can we can put it on the agenda and have another discussion around it in in two weeks and and like i said if we don't you know if we don't make a ton of progress on it that's that's fine we can we can gradually start to to think about these things I wonder if it would help if we put this in a separate doc. So not the not the template, but just put these notes in a separate doc where maybe a few of us, Justin, Sophia, Chan, um, can collaborate on trying to maybe separate some of them out. And at least at least that gives us a place to start start working on it. Okay. So I will uh I will do that. Um, we have six minutes. I'm gonna be here in two weeks to check back in on that. I just want to get a head count of folks. I know Sophia, you said you won't be here. I won't be here, but I mean, I can look at a doc offline. Okay. Um, in between, it's just not helping to guide the discussion at all. Yeah, I can I can bring it up and make sure that it gets spoken about. I just want to make sure folks will be here because if Sophia is not going to be here, I just wanted to check in that others will be. Otherwise, it'll. Maybe it, it's worth, I mean, I'll bring it back up if nobody says anything, but. Okay, yeah, we'll check back in. Just wanted to ask. Okay, I will I will create a doc and share it. Um, I'll put it in this meeting, um, in these meeting minutes, and then in, um, in the Slack channel. 
so do we want to talk about the cross OSPO experiment progress or do we want to talk about the to do yeah, your let's, let's talk channel? about so um okay. a, a very young and foolish man said i will absolutely love to run this uh, uh, cross ospo experiment uh over the course of six months uh was the original idea i think and then i had to do planning for my actual job that pays me money to be here and they were like you definitely don't have time for that don't do that you don't have time um so i don't have time to run this uh i apologize for the change in priority that's happened um but the other thing that I was thinking about before this meeting is that the cross OSPO experiment, as I remember, was essentially that we all wanted to implement a metrics model and then come back and see what the progress of implementing that metrics model was and see how it changed our organization. Um, there is a working group that we can talk about how implementing metrics models are going or is going, I guess. Um, the metrics model working groups that we already have are probably a good venue for the work that we would be doing in this project. So if you have slated to do the work for the project for experimenting with a metrics model, um, I'm going to be talking about how viability is going in the um, metrics model working group anyway. Uh, I'm just not going to be coordinating all of that feedback and collating it in any kind of meaningful way because I just don't have the time to hunt everybody down and come up with topics and come up with like unifying themes and track progress and then synthesize it all into a document. I just don't have time. Um, but we can definitely talk about it as we go uh, into, oh, hey, uh, Chan, feel free to jump into this conversation here. Uh, I'll potentially be at that meeting. It's in the new, oh, okay, sorry. That's for this next OSPO meeting, sorry. Uh, I thought it was related to what I was saying right now. So if you are interested in experimenting with uh, the viability uh, model or some other model, then please do come to that metrics working group. I will be uh, updating on progress as I implement Augur, put things into Augur, talk to folks in my organization and see what kind of change we can actually make. Um, but the short version is I signed up for something that I don't actually have time for to run this. Uh, so that's my bad. Sorry about that. If you're really excited, we still have a way to do it, but I'm not going to be coordinating it. I feel like we've all been in that situation, Gary. So don't don't feel bad. I'm trying to be humble and not get too red in the face. <laughs> uh, Emma was also one of the drivers behind this, so maybe maybe we need to reach out to Emma and see if um, if she wanted to drive this yeah. or. I don't know if anybody else wants to um, jump in. Okay, Justin said he'd ask Emma about that. So that would be perfect. Thank you. Be great, Justin. Thank you. Okay, we have two minutes. Uh, Jamie. Yeah, I'm happy if we talk about this one async as well. But um, at Elastic, we're we we're recently talking about like, outbound open source and trying to get a view of what people are doing because it's nice to shout out about the awesome open source people are doing. Um, and I wondered if anyone had any tooling, um, manual processes, things that have helped in the past, um, as well as things like scraping commits on projects for email addresses and things like that. I, I definitely can shout out that um... For some uh, contributions, we actually have CLAs that we have to sign, um, or we have groups that folks have to join to sign CLAs. And so that's easy to keep track of people um, who are going in and out is that instead of signing as an individual representing the company, they're signing into that group. And then the group is like negotiating that CLA. Yeah, and oh, sorry, Justin, you've got your hand up. Why don't you go first? Oh yeah, so so like um, we've got a um, he um, LA uh, um, chur chur um, chur racking process, and then also um, people can um, like. Um, they ink their um GitHub account. Uh, uh, um, so I just have like oh, uh, what what he can I uh, tr track like a uh, 
what they do. Um, and so like, um, th that's not like a perfect because like, um, we can't tell, um, what, and it's on, um, personal time, right? But it does like, um, give us, um, a, a good idea, um, of the scale and, and like, um, where, um, um, contributions, um, are, I'm occurring, um, and it's a, uh, um, something for like, I'm th thinking about like, um, how to, um, um, to influence um, as well. Um, so like, uh, can we like, um, do a better job of like, um, adding people like, no, um, what, and there's like, um, opportunities to, um, um, contribute to, to a, um, tie, um, um, to impact project. And then, um, every like, um, some Esther, um, we like, um, had people, um, know like, uh, when they've like, um, um, done any, um, contributions to a, um, a, um, repository that like builds a package that like, um, um, a, um, Microsoft, uh, product or service, um, um, depends on. Yeah, and I would encourage you, if you haven't already listened to the podcast that I just did with, with Justin, Emma, and James at Microsoft, they did talk a little bit about, about that. So that, that's a good thing, too. But I think Justin made a really important point uh, that I want to make sure people don't miss, which is that, that Microsoft asks the employees to link with their GitHub account, which is, is sort of an opt-in model, which I think is important from a privacy perspective. So you're you're letting your employees opt in to giving you their GitHub handles as opposed to um, finding an automated way of doing that, which can feel a bit big brother to some of your employees. Uh, Sophia. Uh, yep, we pretty much do that as well. Uh, we have looked at compliance by looking at who's contributing and seeing how many people we're missing, but we don't track those people because they haven't opted in, to your point. Um, and then we use that record against GitHub Archive and basically have an internal collection of records um, around what people are doing. And it's not totally comprehensive because archive is flawed uh, for other reasons I will not go into right now, uh, but it does create a pretty good record. Um, and then we do expose that back to anyone who's contributed on GitHub and allow them to say, calculate all of their contributions from last year, when and where and how much. Um, and so we created a table for that, but mostly it's built off of archives. So just think of it as the filter version of that um, to create an internal record of this. Um, for other things, it's really dependent on the platform. That's just the GitHub version, because um, clearly we have other platforms that open source work is happening and some we have better or worse ways to do this. Um, and as, as Justin mentioned, I think it was Justin mentioned this, um, we don't really have a way to separate personal time and not personal time. Um, so we can look at what is definitively under a Google org and not under a Google org and what is under a null org, which is your personal stuff. Um, but if you're familiar with the GitHub workflow, anytime you create a fork for a PR, all that's happening in your personal repo and most of those PRs end up getting merged back into another project. So just looking at personal stuff isn't necessarily always personal stuff. Um, so there's a lot of gray area again, as mentioned again, but um, that's one way to do it. And I plus one Don's point of having this as an opt-in tool. So everyone's fully aware of it um, and chooses to participate uh, versus being spied on without their knowledge. Uh, Alyssa, we'll give Alyssa the last word, but we're already five minutes over. Um, I just want to say we also do opt-in too, and the way we distinguish between personal and, and work is that we have a program that allows people to get credit, like um, voluntary credit for doing volunteer efforts. And so we ask them to also opt in to, uh, um, um, to 
clearly stating that they are um, doing doing work that's in a volunteer capacity. Awesome, thanks. All right, everybody, we are already five minutes over. Thank you, everyone. I feel like this is a really, really interesting meeting. I thought we had really good conversations. So thank you, everyone, for participating. And uh, if we don't, yeah, we'll see, we'll see you in two weeks in this in this meeting for those of us that will be here. And the rest of us, we'll see you in Slack or whatever. Thanks, thank everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.